Good afternoon. I'm Paul Pugsley with Priority Consult. Priority Consult is the developer of Oncology on Track, oncology navigation software used for any cancer type. I'm pleased to introduce today Cam Teams, consulting principal and founding partner with Practice Advantage, a breast medicine consulting group. Cam brings over 15 years of experience in healthcare management and consulting to clients and members of Practice Advantage. And I've had the pleasure of knowing Cam for a couple of years now. Priority Consult's been uh, producing these webinars for the last year, providing these educational events for our clients, customers, and anyone who's interested in uh, learning what Priority Consult is doing to help improve care. Cam, I'd like to turn it over to you and uh, let you begin your presentation. Okay, thank you, Paul. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so, the, the title of this presentation is Developing a High-Risk Program, and so most of the, um, the, uh, the focus of the presentation will be on the steps that you can take to develop a high-risk program as part of either an organized comprehensive breast center um, or, or um, organized breast program or a standalone high-risk program. Um, it, and I guess I should say here, too, that we'll um, take questions at the end. Is that right, Paul? That's right. We'll save questions for the end. And okay. at any time in your GoToWebinar go to toolbar, you can submit a question if you've got something that you want to ask. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's start with um, the, a couple of important uh, takeaways. Um, first of all, this, I'm going to talk to you about how to develop a high-risk program, and there are many facets to, um, to the high-risk program, but there are many different types of programs and clinics um, across the United States, and they offer, they have different tenets to their program. And so as you hear me talk about it today, you'll decide based on what we talk about um, and the uniqueness of your own um, cancer program or center, what might be the best components for you. <clears throat> okay, um, so um, one of the things that we know um, about breast cancer is that uh, only about 5 to 10 percent of all breast cancers are familial or genetic or are breast cancers that we can tie to something. Okay, but so there's 90 percent of all of the breast cancer incidents in the United States that is um, random. And so we know that the only way that we can control that other 90 percent or that we can have an impact on that is to educate women on two things. One, on um, accurate screening based on their age, um, breast awareness so that if they do uh, come across any kind of breast symptom that they present themselves um, for workup of that breast symptom. But most of the impact that we can have on breast cancer incidents across the United States as breast centers, for those of you who represent um, breast centers um, or cancer centers, the biggest impact we can have on the incidence of breast cancer is helping women who are at increased risk identify that they are. Today we know that there are a small number of women in the average primary care practice, for example, who know that they're at increased risk for one reason or another because it's not standard or commonplace discussion in a primary care setting um, other than things like the, a large number of primary relatives who um, have been affected by breast cancer or the existence of the BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation and that discussion between a patient and her primary care provider. So we know that, that the discussion about risk is not happening pervasively in the primary care setting. So how do, we, how do we create that discussion about risk in um, a way that can make an ultimate impact on breast cancer incidence and ultimately survival? 
And that is where a high-risk program um, comes into play. We can make an impact on those, that identification of women who are increased risk and, um, and ultimately change the way that they are screened um, for breast cancer and potentially ultimately affect their survivorship. Um, okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> so um, no matter how we define risk, as I mentioned to you before, a woman who is defined at being at increased risk is a candidate for unique surveillance. And that's what a program is all about. Identifying who she is based on whatever risk factors you define and then giving her a unique surveillance plan to identify a breast cancer at its earliest stage. Okay, so those are my big takeaways um, um, for, um, uh, I, for this particular program. Um, and then finally, it is a significant alternative revenue stream and a patient retention method. Um, that is, of course, something on the business side that, you know, unfortunately in healthcare we do have to be concerned about. <clears throat> but it's always a good thing when you take this idea to your administrators to not only be able to talk about the impact on your cancer population, um, and your, your female population um, as a whole, but also that there is a revenue stream attached to it um, and an impact on, on patient retention. Okay, um, all, all high-risk programs are not created the same. So as I said, you're going to hear different things and you'll take away certain things about um, what we talk about and you'll build your program based on um, how you're going to create your high-risk program and um, integrate it into either your greater cancer program, your women's center, um, or um, just simply your outpatient imaging department, for example. So here are just some examples of high-risk programs. At New York Presbyterian, for example, um, they talk about um, who their um, patients are in their high-risk program and um, who is eligible to participate in their program. And, um, the, and, and you'll see here that those are women who, um, are, um, who they have decided are at, um, are at increased risk and how they go about doing that. Um, at Newton Wellesley, as part of Massachusetts General, um, they have a, a breast cancer risk assessment clinic and um, they put in information to help patients decide um, how, if they're at entry, increased risk or not, and their primary care physicians. They can accrue into the program from filling out a health history form um, the, through the website and through some other methods that I'm going to show you today. Um, St. John, um, their um, uh, high-risk breast clinic um, is uh, identifies the, these areas um, as being accrual um, data points for their high risk program, um, and um, so these are the areas that they uh, define as being increased um, risk factors. And again, some of you may decide um, that uh, you agree with these, some of these, and some of you may um, change your list uh, somewhat. <clears throat> Um, okay, here's another one. These women, here's their list, women who've been diagnosed with breast cancer under 50, have breast or ovarian, bilateral breast cancer, Ashkenazi Jewish, etc. Okay, so you can see here that the definitions, um, this is MD Anderson's, um, the definitions of who fits into a high-risk clinic vary, okay? All right, so now let's talk about how to um, they even include at MD Anderson history, family history of pancreatic cancer, et cetera. So, um, okay, we'll come back to all of this. Um, all right, I'm going to skip over that. All right, so most of us agree on what constitutes risk. It's, it's really just what risk factors you choose to, um, to, to identify women and bring them into your program. But let's just talk for a minute about what are risk factors. So, of course, we know that age is a risk fa factor as it relates to breast cancer. Um, your, 
your uh, risk of developing breast cancer increases as you age. And we know that, for example, if you um, utilize any of the, the breast cancer risk assessment models out there like Gale or BRCAPRO, et cetera, that you can have, you can identify no risk factors at all other than your age and it will, your score can be as high as someone who has significant family history. So age unto itself is, um, is a, a, a significant risk factor. Being female, um, of course, is a risk factor. We know that breast cancer can occur in uh, men, but um, of course being female is um, a, a top risk factor. Okay. Right. Um, other things, a personal history of breast cancer. So this would be the risk of recurrence. Um, this, um, of course, increases your um, risk of, um, of developing breast cancer um, a second time. Family history, um, if you have uh, what we call primary relatives, mother, sister, or daughter, um, that increases your um, risk on many of the models as well as some of the other risk models. Um, take into account um, secondary relatives and, um, and their um, being affected with um, breast cancer. Also the age at which your family members were affected with breast cancer has a lot to do with your own risk factors as well. <clears throat> um, and women who inherit genetic mutations. So if we know that a, pac that a patient's family uh, a patient's family member does have the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene, then we know that they are more likely to, um, to be susceptible to that gene um, themselves, uh, to that mutation, um, and uh, they also um, can be at increased risk for simply developing um, the disease whether or not they have the mutation, have inherited the mutation or not. Um, women who have um, breast disease, which is um, considered to be high risk, things like atypical hyperplasia or um, uh, atypical ductal hyperplasia or simply um, what is referred to, can be just simply referred to as atypia or LCIS, um, they um, are also at increased risk for developing breast cancer. Um, and women who have been diagnosed with ductal carcinoma in situ often have a risk of developing more invasive disease at a future date. Okay, so we know that those are the main areas that um, influence risk. Um, okay, so there are, even though there are different differences in the programs, as I mentioned, there are some standard components, and let's talk about what those are. Okay. So, um, when you develop a high-risk program or a clinic, you need to have a process in place for accruing patients into your program. And then you need a protocol for assessing those patients once you have accrued them into the program and monitoring those patients. <clears throat> then you need to be able to provide them with appropriate high-risk ancillary services. And those can be things like genetic counseling, genetic testing, breast MR. Um, and then you need to be able to provide them with risk-based intervention services. And then the creation of a custom surveillance plan specific to that patient. And then the ability to have a high-risk clinic to follow those women and to, to help them adhere to that surveillance plan that you've developed. So these are the, the main, the six tenets, if you will, of any high-risk program or clinic that most, de depending on who you are, if you're MD Anderson or you're Massachusetts General and Newton Wellesley or um, whoever you are, um, any of you on the phone, these are the main six components of a high-risk program. Okay, so let's talk about these one by one. All right, so planning this accrual process, all right? So who will you accrue into your high-risk program? So typically there are two types of patients that 
accrue into a high-risk program. They can be affected patients or unaffected. Affected patients mean patients that are affected with any kind of breast disease, e either benign or malignant. Okay, And there are a lot of high-risk programs out there that only are targeted toward patients who are affected um, with a, a, um, a, a high-risk uh, breast lesion or patients who are affected currently with breast cancer. And the high-risk program is helping them identify if they are mutation carriers or simply monitoring them for a recurrence based on the fact that they have a personal history of breast cancer. Well, we believe <clears throat> that a high-risk program really should focus on both, that women who are affected with breast disease, malignant or benign, <clears throat> should be, be able to receive specific surveillance for monitoring that disease um, as it is now, if it is a benign disease that's just being monitored, or to be offered um, the ability to be monitored closely for a recurrence. And we think a high-risk program is a great place um, for those patients who are in survivorship, for example, to, um, to be monitored. So we can, you can dovetail uh, a survivorship program with part of your high-risk program in clinic. But most of what we're going to talk about today are your unaffected patients. How do we go about finding, remember I said that 90% of patients who will, be develop, who will develop breast cancer, but, um, but it will be random, and they don't know that they have any risk factors currently that they might be able to mitigate. And those are the, those are the people that we want to, um, to identify. And so, of course, affected patients in a high-risk program are reimbursable. Unaffected are reimbursable. Some of them are um, uncovered patients um, or self-pay, and they are considered, prevent it's pr considered preventive care until the patient is actually affected with the disease. And we'll talk about those nuances a little bit later. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about how do we go about planning. Um, most of you um, are required by um, the administrative team of your cancer center or your hospital to, um, to put together the Excel spreadsheet or the pro forma that talks about where your patient volume is going to come from. And so now we're going to go back to this, th these categories of affected and unaffected, and then we're going to add in another one called moderate risk. So our affected patients are our current breast cancer patients under surveillance. You can certainly choose that as a line item in your pro forma um, or your Excel spreadsheet in planning your volume. BRCA1 and BRCA2 patients, those are patients who we already know are mutation carriers. So they've either, they've already come in and they've been tested, whether or not they had um, a breast cancer diagnosis or not. <clears throat> but if you have a, Bra a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, you want to be monitored very closely for the development of that uh, disease, either in its um, its first incidence or in its occurrence. Okay, unaffected patients. So how do we identify who is at increased risk but they're unaffected? So most of the way that we do that is to um, administer a risk model. And there are several models out there that have been developed um, from a statistical standpoint that a patient answers a series of questions and it helps us give her a score that statistically based on um, clinical trials tells us whether or not she is likely to be at increased risk um, uh, for developing breast cancer. You can, those, those are models um, called Gale, BRCAPRO, Tyracusic, etc. And um, so for Gale and BRCAPRO, for example, we, if we administered that model, then we would choose, um, for example, patients who scored greater than 20 on the lifetime score 
for those two particular models. And that could be a line item of a volume that we would add to our, um, to our spreadsheet. And then um, if they didn't score um, greater than 20%, then we could, we could identify other things, like just simply having two or more first-degree relatives or a family history that suggests inherited disease. They could have a high-risk lesion. Um, um, or other things that you might want to call them, uh, put them in the unaffected category. Sometimes people put um, atypia or LCIS in the affected category, but that'll, that's of course up to you and your clinical stakeholders or partners in developing your program. There are also um, several high-risk programs that include the ability for patients who are considered to be at moderate risk for being part of the high-risk program and to be monitored appropriately. Um, in this particular example, that could be a patient who scores between 17 and 20 um, on the Gale model, patients who had exposure to high-dose radiation under the age of 30, um, early menarche or late menopause, um, a high alcohol intake, etc. cetera. Um, but as part of your planning, you'll identify what these data points are, and then you'll want to come up with your volume. So let's talk about how do you estimate that now, okay? So you've decided what your uh, data points are going to be um, on your spreadsheet for your affected category, unaffected, and if you'll want to include any moderate risk patients potentially in your program. Okay, <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk about um, how to get to that number, but let me just talk for a second about why do we want to accrue patients into a program. Well, it is obviously the ultimate disease management planning. That 90%, again, of the, the breast cancer population, it's random now, and we don't know. All we can do is look at um, our um, National Cancer Institute SEER data for your market area to potentially um, plan for the number of breast cancers that will be diagnosed in your county um, based on you know what has happened over the past five years um, and what the whether or not the estimates are likely to go up or down given um, your population estimates but isn't it better to say we know how many of those women we have in our screening pool um, for screening mammography, and we also know how many of those women are coming through our program, and we are identifying our increased risk for developing breast cancer, and who ultimately will be diagnosed. So now you put in process a way to really hone in on that 5 to 10 percent that are inherited, as well as of the 90 percent, you can identify those women who are at increased risk, not for familial or genetic reasons, but other reasons, and help them either mitigate that risk or have a surveillance plan that finds that breast cancer at its earliest stage. And that way, we know that we can have an impact on that that group of random breast cancers. So it's a good PR tool um, to say that we're doing much more than just providing mammograms to our patients. We are taking those women and we are screening them not only with x-ray of their breasts, but we're also asking them a series of questions and screening them based on their risk and then accruing them into an appropriate program that gives them access to specific and custom surveillance based on their own personal risk factors. So if we know our volume of high-risk patients, we can manage so many things. If we know who's at increased risk and who ultimately might develop breast cancer, we can do lots of things like plan for capital expenditures associated with cancer treatment. We know how we can build our cancer program to keep pace with the number of cancer patients that we're ultimately going to accrue. Um, so it is, um, it, it's, a, it's a great way to have personalized um, oncology planning, if you will. 
Um, and then, of course, finally, it is an additional revenue stream. And you know, in these economic times related to health care, that is you know, an important line item um, that shouldn't be missed. All right, so now let's go on to how do you, um, when you accrue the patients into the program, how do, what are the ways to do that? So now we've, got, we've identified our data points back here that showed what, we're, what we want to bring into the program, affected, unaffected, maybe moderate risk patients. Um, this is our strategic planning, and we've identified what those areas are. Now, how do we go about doing it, and what might those numbers be? Okay, so um, we must easily identify those patients. <clears throat> and how do we do it? Well, it, it, we have found that the best way to do that is to gather those women at the time of mammography. That's when you have them in um, a captive state um, and you can you already ask them if you're providing mammography as part of your women's center, your cancer center, your outpatient imaging department, you're already providing them with a history questionnaire that probably asks them several of the questions already that we need the answers to in order to provide that, get to get that statistical score that will help us decide if they meet the threshold to be considered high risk or moderate risk. Um, and that, that is an important element for most of you to think about when you're considering building a high risk program. You're already, um, most of you, um, a fair way there because you are asking the questions already. Okay, so we think the, the easiest way is to start at screening mammography. <clears throat> um, also, at the time of the internal center consultation. So if the patient is um, participating in a cancer consultation inside your current cancer center, that is a great way to identify patients who are potentially at increased risk. And that means to add the NCCN guidelines to your initial cancer consultations, if you haven't already, um, they, they clearly are, um, are um, pointed out as part of the new, um, uh, a newly diagnosed patient to look at um, her age at onset and um, the, her, um, the specific pathology of her cancer to see if indeed she might be a candidate for genetic counseling and testing. <clears throat> and that counseling and testing um, of your newly diagnosed patients as well as as you are talking to them about their own family history, if they meet those NCCN guidelines, you often, when you think about the building of a pedigree, you find other people in that cancer patient's family who could be who may not be affected with breast cancer, but who would be unaffected, but potentially at increased risk, who would could accrue and be part of your high risk program. Um, of course, outside provider referral, as you build your high risk program and you let your outside primary care physicians know that you have a, an organized high risk program in place then there's a place for them to refer patients to who they know are at increased risk um, from their individual practice. And then finally, for patients who have concerns about their, their own risk to be able to self-refer. Okay, so those are the main referral areas um, for um, accruing patients into your program. All right. <clears throat> so, um, let's talk about these individually. So at the time of the internal center screening um, for mammography. So let's talk about how that happens. Remember I said you probably already ask the patient these questions to begin with. <clears throat> um, so what we recommend is that if you have any sort of tracking methodology in place in your, as part of your oncology program, as part of your um, mammography um, um, system, as part of your outpatient imaging, et cetera, um, that you utilize the ability to screen those patients for their breast cancer risk. So um, you also can do this um, with paper. 
Okay, but of course, if you have a, an electronic ability to track, identify, and then navigate patients through this high-risk program, even better. Um, and and so we're going to talk about that navigation um, of these patients as you accrue them into the program and why that navigation is so important. So these are just some examples of what how easy it is to quickly identify a patient's risk at the time of mammography. Um, it's simply um, this is a, an example of um, oncology on track, and it's it's simply seven questions of which you probably already ask a fair amount of these. Um, uh, here is another example um, of uh, just a few questions um, for uh, a patient using um, uh, mammography reporting systems, and, um, and then here are some questions using um, uh, MagView. And um, so if you use a system that already allows you to track, then it, they, it will either just store the information for you, um, or it will allow you to um, uh, calculate the risk and, and um, accrue those patients in <clears throat> to a specific navigation list that allows you to follow up with those patients in a timely fashion and then move them through the disease navigation process. Okay, so um, you must um, uh, easily identify them as we said. So um, you can do it with paper, you can do it with um, an electronic model. Okay, and so um, let's talk about what I mentioned before, what these models are. Um, and so if you do utilize an electronic tracking system, many of these tracking systems utilize one or more of these models uh, in their tracking system. Okay, so be sure that as you are looking at either doing it on paper or utilizing a system that you may already have in, pro in place or purchasing a system to support your high-risk program or your greater cancer program um, or um, uh, oncology program that, that it does have access to one of these four models. So the most widely known model, and I'm just going to talk about these briefly, the, the, the most widely known model and the model that has been around the longest is called the Gale model. And this model is the model that you'll find as the breast cancer uh, risk assessment tool on the National Cancer Institute's website. Um, now, the limitations of this model are it only estimates a woman's risk for developing invasive breast cancer, um, so it would not estimate risk for any in situ cancer like lobular carcinoma or ductal carcinoma. Um, and it um, is most widely known for estimating its for lifetime risk of breast cancer, but Gale also uh, does calculate a five-year risk, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. So Gale is the most widely utilized. Um, BRCA Pro um, also is, does a lifetime risk, um, and it also uh, does a <clears throat> estimates a woman's risk of having that BRCA1 or BRCA2 um, mutation. Okay, um, and then um, the Klaus model also does lifetime risk of breast cancer. Um, it does look at, um, uh, heavily looks at family history um, and the age of onset of those uh, family members. Um, and um, it doesn't look at any other risk factors other than breast cancer in the patient. So um, it, doesn't, it doesn't look at things like when she started menstruating or when she stopped or her if she had children or, or not, which is considered in BRCA Pro and Gale. Um, Klaus does not consider ovarian cancer as um, a risk factor, whereas um, BRCA Pro does, um, Gale does not. Um, Tyracusic is the newest uh, model that is being, that's getting a lot of traction for being a very well validated and thorough model. Um, it does uh, uh, tell us a lifetime risk of breast cancer like 
uh, Gale and BRCA Pro and Klaus. Um, unlike, uh, so Gale also does five year, as I mentioned. Um, Tyra Cusick does a 10 year and uh, a lifetime. And it looks at uh, many family members, and um, it also looks at other risk factors, which we call endocrine risk factors. So if you think about it, Tyracusic is sort of a great combination of Gale and BRCA Pro together, um, I, if I had to describe it in an easy way. Um, it also considers a woman's body mass index, which we know is being validated in many scientific studies as a risk factor for breast cancer. Um, it has not been around as long as Gale or BRCA Pro or Klaus and doesn't have the clinical trial um, uh, data points behind it, um, but it's getting there. And um, um, so these are, if you are, when you are considering your high risk program and what models you'd like to have available, these are the four that I would recommend that you consider, okay? All right, so if we're going to um, accrue the patient at the time of internal screening, then you want to have a great plan for doing that. So that requires you to put in staff to complete that risk assessment data um, on paper with the patient um, and, or to be able to check those boxes on your electronic um, uh, disease navigation or mammography tracking system. It may require some additional IT support um, in order for you to easily um, tag those women as part of screening mammography. Um, and it may require just a little bit of extra time at registration or, or pre-registration. Okay, um, outside provider referral, um, you can do this lots of different ways. You can support um, this um, referral um, source. Um, of course, marketing materials, you need to explain to the outside providers all about your program and how to get the patient into the program. Have easy order forms. Um, you can put an order form on your website. You can allow your, your primary care physicians who want to refer patients to be able to um, enter the patient's risk data. Um, on an outside website and then send it in. Lots of different ways, but um, what I want to encourage you is make the accrual process, vet the process, make sure it uses approved models that your team has clinically validated, and, but then make them as accessible as possible so that you can accrue in as many appropriate patients um, uh, as are out there for you. Um, and then make sure that they, your outside providers understand your protocols so that if they're referring patients, that they know who is potentially at high risk in their patient base and then what you're going to do with those patients, that they understand what will happen when they come to you so that they're not concerned about um, the, the guide that, that appropriate um, pathways will be followed. So, of course, talk to the your outside providers about what, um, that you'll be following NCCN guidelines and that you'll be sharing information back with them about what happens to the patient after they come into your high-risk program, are evaluated, um, provided with interventions, and are ready for surveillance. Self-referral, of course, you need a great website in order to do that that talks about how to become, how to become a high-risk patient in your program, how to receive your assessment, materials, um, uh, etc. All right, so now let's go back to how do we calculate these numbers. Um, this is, these are very important questions. All right, so I'm going to use a couple of examples here, and so now you can sort of take some of your own numbers about your mammograms and, um, and potentially run through what your potential volume could be for your center given um, the, some, your data point choices. Okay, so in this particular example, we're going to say that <clears throat> um, of our cancer patients, we looked back and said in this example at this breast center that we identified about 25 patients a year um, that currently had breast cancer that um, were um, that um, had 
um, risk factors that were going to that wanted to be ha wanted to have surveillance in our high risk program. Okay, that would not be um, surveilled with their medical oncologist or in another setting. Okay, and this number is likely to to be much higher if you decide that you want your entire survivorship program to be um, inside the high risk program. Okay, <clears throat> direct referrals. We said we probably would get about 200 patients a year um, from self referral and from our primary care providers who once we provided them with information about what we that we were building the high risk program that they would go through their patients and um, identify uh, patients who were potential candidates um, for our high risk program okay um, and then we discovered that based on our numbers that we probably would have about 20 patients who would test positive out of our breast cancer patients who would test positive for the BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation through BRCA analysis testing who would want to come into our high risk program or who would have a family member who would want to um, accrue into the the high risk program directly because of either BRAC analysis testing, either a positive or an, even a negative result, but that is how that is the um, the pathway pathway that would likely bring them into our program. Okay, so then what we would then what we did was we looked at our um, potential um, high risk uh, patients who um, would school who using our model would score 20% um, or higher on our lifetime risk and so based on our 21,000 mammograms annually we estimated that about 840 patients would um, score greater than 20% on our Gale model and in this in this one we used um, Gale and not BRCA Pro and so then of those um, uh, of those patients the um, <clears throat> it would probably be a little bit higher than that um, but probably about 840 was our estimate would accrue into the program because not everybody who scores greater than 20% in your risk assessment at the time of mammogram actually wants to come in and be part of the program. <clears throat> so you probably want to back that number down just a little bit to be conservative. So our high risk program in this case um, was about um, 1,065 patients a year or 88 patients a month. Okay, so you can see that, um, that example. Now, of those, remember how I said you also need to plan for other things. Um, so if you look over here, this is something important. Of these 840 patients, about 336 of those will be eligible based on their BRCA Pro score. Um, because NCCN guidelines related to screening breast MRIs say that they like to have patients um, who score greater than 20% on models that heavily consider family history. And so we like to accrue patients in with Gale because it's the easiest, because it only has seven questions, um, or um, of course whatever model is built into a program that you already have in place. But, but if you're starting from scratch, we think Gale is incredibly appropriate. But we also then like to go back and run her BRCA Pro score to see if she's indeed eligible for screening breast MRI. And this is something that we want you to plan for from the very beginning because obviously if you, do, if you have a busy magnet um, and you need to plan for another 336 breast MRIs, this is an important data point in planning for your high risk program. Um, so that either means that you need to consider a dedicated magnet um, based on your volume or it means that you need to consider um, a, a, a duplicate magnet so that you have um, room for this growth. Um, you also need to consider, do you have 
radiologists on staff who can read those mammograms and interpret them as part of your high-risk program. The other thing is um, to understand how many patients out of this 1,065 will also be candidates for BRCA analysis <clears throat> and will ultimately um, have BRCA1 and BRCA2 uh, results. At this point, we usually say that about 2.3% of the participants um, will score, um, uh, will um, end up with a BRCA1 or BRCA2 uh, mutation who are candidates for testing. Okay, <clears throat> so and normally the number that we use, and you probably want to write this down, the number that we use is if you take your total screening mammogram volume and you multiply that times between about 3 and 5 percent, that's the number of patients using the Gale model. That's the number of patients who will score greater than 20 percent um, lifetime risk in your screening population. So 3 to 5 percent of your screening population um, should be your number here and then back it down a little bit. Um, for attrition, okay? But that is a really good number just based on our, the number of high-risk programs that we've put in place across the United States um, of patients who will score um, greater than 20 percent, okay? All right, so the, here you are. You've got your numbers in your Excel spreadsheet and you're ready to really do, to roll your sleeves up and do some planning about how you will um, put in place your program to address these um, these women. Okay, so maybe you're going to use all three of those accrual methods um, at the time of screening, um, internal to your cancer center, outside pro um, provider referral, self-referral, etc. And, um, and then that's going to help you identify um, uh, your ultimate number. Okay? All right, so now you're also going to need to identify the protocols that you'll use on those women that you accrue into the program. And of course, it's typically a many-fold process. Um, it, when, so once you've got your Excel spreadsheet with your volume, then you sit down with your stakeholders. And typically, this is a radiologist who has a keen interest in, um, in breast imaging and breast cancer detection. A, um, perhaps a breast surgeon, and likely a medical oncologist and um, genetic counselor if you have one as part of your team. Um, and then, of course, the administrative people who are going to be part of building this. And so it's typically a, a many-faceted process. It is definitely going to include the NCCN guidelines for screening and diagnosis, for the um, for um, uh, breast can for risk reduction um, and for um, for identification of patients who are at increased risk for familial or genetic um, uh, risk. Okay, so this is all identified in NCCN guidelines, <clears throat> and these are easily downloadable from the NCCN website. Um, then, of course, we recommend other, um, the American Cancer Society, of course, and their guidelines, and then any other society consensus statements like the American Society of Breast Surgeons or the Society for Breast Imaging. And then the combination of these shows your referring physicians that you have in place the foundation for being able to, once you identify those patients, to be able to appropriately um, identify what are the next interventions with those patients that are appropriate, and then ultimately a, a surveillance plan that is supported by um, NCCN guidelines. Okay, so um, you've defined your uh, risk gathering process. That is, you know, either using paper or an electronic system, a system that you have in place, or purchasing a new system in order to identify women and then manage them through the disease process. You define your patient types um, and your um, your. Um, now we're going to talk about service types and um, how to support um, how to support those. All right, so. Um, 
the paper, um, the personnel, are you going to use an internal system? Um, uh, will you add additional programs for identifying increased um, uh, for in identifying increased risk? Um, we put in a program in our high risk clinics called Hughes Risk Apps that was developed at Massachusetts General Hospital, and it has all of the models in one location, <clears throat> and you can you can find that easily on. Um, uh, you can Google it and it will um, bring up this website and talk to you a little bit about the program. Um, and um, then are you going to, once you identify the women, are you going to navigate them? And how are you going to navigate them? Um, are you going to do that with a navigation system like Oncology on Track? Um, or are you going to have a dedicated um, navigator uh, who will navigate them, a person? Um, who is watching the patients through the steps of the process. Okay, we've identified our affected and our unaffected and moderate patients. Okay, so remember, we're, we've put in our numbers on our spreadsheet, and um, we've got, in our example, we used, effect, we used affected and we used unaffected. Um, and are you also going to add your moderate risk patients? <clears throat> if you're going to add moderate risk patients, then you'll need to add another line item down here that would increase your total potential volume. And if anybody wants to talk about that later, what percentage of your screening population are moderate, are typically moderate, um, we can talk about that um, after the fact. Okay. All right, so are you going to call it a program or a clinic? Um, and, um, you know, typically a program is just identifying women, um, and then a clinic is organized time set aside to evaluate and monitor those patients. So typically it's both. It's a program and, um, and a clinic. And then these are the types of services that are offered based on who they are. Um, consultations, preventive counseling, um, and established patient uh, or what we call risk management. So they come in, let's we'll just we'll take an affected patient as an example. You identify them at screening mammogram and you identify their at, at, at the unaffected, I'm sorry, you identify them at screening mammogram. They come in for a consultation and then they um, we look at all of their facets of risk, then they get preventive counseling about what they can do to lower their risk. Things like, um, first of all, being eligible for screening breast MRI and looking for occult cancer that is not seen on uh, mammography. Perhaps if they are at um, increase for a mutation, they're candidates for genetic counseling or screening or, or testing. Um, Sometimes unaffected women are then, um, if they do um, test positive for a mutation, they're candidates for chemoprophylaxis. That means they can take tamoxifen or another um, chemo um, agent over their lifetime in order to um, ward off the eventual incidence of breast cancer. Um, some women uh, also who are BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation carriers can elect prophylactic um, surgery as one of their um, uh, steps toward reducing risk. Um, and then they can become an um, established patient for um, ongoing risk management. Okay? So then um, you're looking at all of these, how uh, these are the different types. These you can you um, know translate into CPT codes and and that sort of thing. Um, some high risk clinics offer ductal lavage for further risk stratification. And again, you can make this decision as part of your multidisciplinary team. Um, it is um, it has some controversy associated with it, but there are also plenty of nationally recognized high risk programs that do offer um, ductal lavage and do support um, it as a data point for um, identifying women who um, have atypical, um, the presence of atypical cells in their ducts. 
Okay, <clears throat> so there are other supporting risk services inside of this program that you have now um, built your Excel spreadsheet for, that you've decided what your accrual methods are, um, etc. And those are things like genetic counseling, genetic testing. You must have the ability to offer breast MRI. Um, there are psychosocial aspects to a high-risk program, chemo prevention, surgical intervention, as I mentioned, nutrition, um, and cessation services. For example, one of the things when a patient makes it into a high-risk program, one of the questions that we ask is related to their alcohol intake. And if you find that a woman has a high alcohol intake, and we know that reducing that will, will ultimately reduce her breast cancer risk, she may need access to alcohol cessation services. Um, so <clears throat> if you don't have a genetic uh, counselor on staff, then there are other uh, genetic counseling services in the United States. Um, there, we use, uh, for our clients who do not have employed genetic counselors, we use a service um, out of Florida called Informed Medical Decisions or Informed DNA that offers telephonic genetic counseling, which we think is great. If a woman is at increased risk because of her uh, familial risk um, and there has to be genetic counseling, which can be incredibly intimidating at times, we like the idea that that can occur at the kitchen table over the phone with um, one of our patients, you know, drinking a nice uh, cup of coffee and talking with the genetic counselor um, over the phone as opposed to, um, you know, having to have an appointment on an academic campus somewhere. So you need to understand what sort of supporting services need to be in place either, um, uh, and not all of these, of course, have to be on site. They can be referred, um, but you need to have the ability to access these uh, for your patient. All right, um, let's talk about um, uh, so genetic counseling and testing. We talked about that, um, having the pathways in place to identify what women are candidates for those programs, um, and genetic counseling, genetic testing, nutrition, et cetera. Um, for genetic counseling and testing, you can do the testing um, within your own center. Um, you can, and you can become a referral center for Myriad, who uh, is the only uh, testing laboratory to offer BRCA analysis currently. They have the patent on the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene, as many of you, you all know. All right, um, so um, understand, let's talk a little bit about breast MR again. This is very important because most of your patients are going to be candidates for screening breast MR, um, depending on what your payer behavior is. Um, as I said, NCCN guidelines say that they like for you to consider a model that heavily um, considers family history. However, there are many payers who will pay for screening breast MRI based on Gale model only um, and do not um, spell out a specific uh, risk model like BRCA Pro. Okay, um, and so you need to have those volume considerations again. For example, um, if you have six a day from risk screening, which you very well could have, um, then um, how are you going to um, rotate those patients? Are you going to have a dedicated unit? Okay, um, and um, genetic counseling, what are you going to do with, um, to have access for that, for testing, dietitian, and psychosocial, as we mentioned before. Um, so just important things uh, for you to consider in your planning process, okay? Um, make sure you have your, your uh, protocols in place and you've identified um, where they are in what protocol manual uh, inside of the NCCN um, guidelines so that it's easy to um, identify um, uh, what, what page uh, each particular patient falls on. Okay, um, also understand what the indications are for breast MRI um, and, of course, your own uh, payer behavior, all right? We love to see when um, there is a high-risk program in place and there's uh, an Aurora magnet to go along with it, 
All right, so provider staff, um, you're going to take your numbers and then you're going to identify, you know, what you can do um, if we had, you know, 94, this particular example had, um, at Sally Job had 94 patients a month. The example we had um, a minute ago had um, 88 patients, I think. <clears throat> and then so how do you translate that? Um, an average 30-minute encounter, that's 47 hours per month or six clinic days. Um, what does that look like? It could be two days per week, um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then, and then who, who should be that encounter provider? Should it be a nurse practitioner, um, a primary care provider, a multi-specialty provider like um, uh, uh, a breast surgeon or a medical oncologist? All right. Um, and then, of course, the people on the administrative side are going to ask you to talk to them about CPT codes and how and what reimbursement uh, is attached to these CPT codes um, based on your payer mix. So this is um, uh, so you'll want to investigate what those um, uh, what those CPT codes pay in your particular area for affected patients or unaffected patients preventive medicine codes or simply um, evaluation and management codes. And then finally, you want to spend, like we started saying, a fair amount of time marketing your high-risk clinic to your referral sources, to your current and prospective patients, with websites, with materials that help everyone understand how you're going to um, provide them with risk-based screening as part of mammography um, and um, how they can get into your program uh, if they don't come through your uh, a, a, an accrual method like uh, mammography. Okay, so now as you go back and you research different high-risk clinics, you'll see many of these are are totally different in the way that they accrue patients in. Um, sometimes it is a um, it's direct patient referral. Sometimes they come um, after they um, get a risk assessment and a clinical breast exam. Um, sometimes they come in after genetic counseling and testing. But you can see here everybody's different, and so you'll you'll go through the information we've talked about today, and you'll decide oop, on what are the components of your own program and who are the candidates and how they relate back to that Excel spreadsheet that you used from the very beginning to build who that potential volume would be. Okay. Huh. All right, 401. Paul? All right, you did it, Cam. Good job. <laughs> and okay, uh, we, were, we were... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Do you, do you want to um, see if we can address a couple of questions, if anybody wants to stay on, or? Well, we have, to be mindful of everybody's time, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to go over a few questions submitted uh, during the webinar. Okay. And a lot of them are about, uh, will we share the slides? And um, obviously, Cam, you have offered to reach out to anybody on an, indivi on an individual basis if they have particular questions about your slides. And we have recorded this webinar. So we will post it on the Priority Console website and uh, make sure to send everybody a link on where it is. Okay. And, um, and Ken, you did a great job of incorporating all the um, pre-webinar questions into your presentation. Great. And, um, anybody who, yeah, I'm glad anybody that worked out. Yeah, it worked out great, so thank you. And um, um, one question, Cam, um, mm -hmm. is uh, do you know if there will be a, an accrediting body for this designation or for a high-risk program? That's a great question. <clears throat> I know that um, one of the things that we um, do with all of our programs is we talk about how the program fulfills some of the NAPBC standards as it relates to providing genetic uh, counseling and testing and risk assessment. So. Right now, uh, building a high-risk program, of course, satisfies NAPBC requirements, and we, we hope and we think that NAPBC is going to expand those uh, requirements in the years to come, as, as we've seen their standards um, evolving over the last couple of years. So we think that we'll see um, the, their risk-based standards 
um, evolve um, as we see national um, breast uh, centers <clears throat> evolving to include high risk as just a standard component to what they provide. And I think that you'll see the accrediting organizations keep pace with those um, national um, comprehensive breast centers that really set the standard across the United States. Great, thank you. And we have a couple of questions that are asking more about revenue capture. And okay. um, while they're relating specifically to your slides, I would okay. encourage anybody to actually reach out to CAM if they want to talk more about uh, revenue capture um, after the webinar. Right. Because, um, we'll of course, sure it, doing... it all depends. Your revenue capture, of course, all depends on what you what your um, your volume uh, numbers were in your original spreadsheet. So when you build that Excel spreadsheet um, and you've put those line items in, that helps you. We need to have that first. Um, so if if you decide you do want to talk to me later, be sure that you have just at least some draft ideas of what you want those line items in your spreadsheet to be. Um, or what you think they'll be, and then we can talk about what revenue is likely to come from those, okay? <clears throat> but it, it definitely is a program that can be self-sustaining. Um, it can, um, in, in our experience, it, is, it both pays for a dedicated provider to support that program, and, you know, it certainly can have a margin um, a good contribution margin attached to it, and uh, and one of the main reasons is, as many of you know, not because of the the evaluation and management visits, which I think are are a, a fantastic and the most valuable part of it. When you are sitting down with the patient face to face and talking to her, educating her about her risk, and putting in plan a surveillance, um, uh, putting in place a surveillance plan that matches her risk um, individually. That, of course, is the most valuable, um, but we know that, you know, that time um, with the patient is, you know, typically reimbursed at, you know, depending on the time, you know, let's say it's $200 for that visit. That's a far cry from the other things like um, breast MRI and other uh, interventions. So it, it's important for you to start with your spreadsheet, have some draft ideas in there, and then um, we can talk about, uh, you know, filling in the, putting the pro forma together, um, the two of us, after the fact. So just feel free to email me and, and we'll work with you one-on-one -on -one with your spreadsheet for, to build your pro forma. Great. CAM Teams of Practice Advantage, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. All right. And once again, this is Paul Pugsley with Priority Consult. And our, our next oncology-related webinar will be July 10th. So make sure to check our website for, for more information on that. Cam, once again, thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.